This talk addresses the alternative scanning approaches possible in neurosonography as a way of expanding the diagnostic capacity of ultrasound and as a problem-solving tool. Most standard cranial sonography is performed through the anterior fontanelle using a sagittal and coronal approach. However, there are a number of other imaging portals that will allow us to look at relatively hidden areas of the brain, including the posterior fossa, that are not adequately addressed using the anterior, the anterior fontanelle. The first fontanelle that I'd like to cover is the posterior fontanelle. It's located at the junction of the parietal and occipital bones. It's in the midline and can be found by simply bringing the transducer posteriorly along the midline until you feel the opening of the posterior fontanelle. You can typically image in both sagittal and transverse orientation. However, the sagittal is much more useful. Here is an example of an image of a premature infant with intracranial intraventricular hemorrhage. The image on the left of the screen is obtained through the anterior fontanelle. With the patient in the same position, we can see using the image on the right obtained through the posterior fontanelle that one can see the posterior aspect of the periventricular white matter as well as the atrium of the lateral ventricle much better using this approach. In another example, we have an infant who had a complex cystic lesion in the white matter that was very peripheral, posterior, parietal, and occipital. Using the anterior fontanelle on these two views, we could not d determine the extent of the lesion and, in fact, if the lesion was all intraparenchymal or included an extraaxial component. Using the posterior fontanelle, we could see that these focal areas of um, complex fluid were in fact liquefying hematomas that were in the peripheral cortex of the brain. And so the posterior fontanelle was very useful in identifying and better characterizing these lesions. The next sonographic window that I wanted to touch on is the squamosal suture located at the junction of the, the temporal and parietal bones. Even though the suture may be quite small, the terion or uh, inferior aspect of the parietal bones is very thin and allows the transmission of ultrasound. Scanning in an axial projection, uh, this view is an excellent view for looking at the basal cisterns. The image on the left is an axial image obtained at the level of the cerebral peduncles. Here the asterisk shows the midbrain and um, cerebral peduncles with a thin and echogenic rim of basal cisterns surrounding the midbrain. This is the normal appearance. The slide or the image on your right shows expansion of the basal cisterns with blood in a baby who has a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Here we can see expansion and increased echogenicity um, filling the basal cisterns and the interpedicular, interpeduncular cistern. We can also see, shown by the blue arrow, a dilated aqueduct of sylvius surrounded by a thick rim of ependema consistent with ependymitis. This is the best view for identifying subarachnoid hemorrhage or subarachnoid collections. In the same infant, as we scan slightly more uh, inferiorly, we can see the presence of a supratentorial clot. This clot was not well seen on the anterior fontanelle views. The other use for this projection is uh, to evaluate uh, extraaxial fluid collections. Uh, 
here on a magnified transverse view using the anterior fontanelle, we can see a complex extraxial fluid collection. However, because our field of view is so limited, we cannot evaluate the extent of the collection. Using the, the squamosal suture and axial scanning, we can identify the extent of this subdural collection. Here you, we can see the edge of the brain and echolucent fluid between the edge of the brain and the calvarium. The workhorse for us is the mastoid fontanelle. We have included the, the, this view in our standard sonography on all but very few cases at um, our institution. The mastoid fontanelle is located at the junction of the parietal, the temporal, and the occipital bone. The external landmarks for it are uh, located one centimeter behind the tragus of the ear and between one half and one centimeter superior to that line. The transducer is placed behind the ear in this location and oriented in an exaggerated orbitomiatal line as shown by the blue line on the skull. The representative sagittal image of the brain is shown to the right and showing the area that is scanned by the mastoid approach. The square that is surrounded by blue is shown on the sagittal image which is a level just at the fourth ventricle. And here you can see in the asterisk, where the asterisk is located, we can see the fourth ventricle, we can see the cisterna magna posteriorly, and we can see the midbrain and cerebral peduncles, cerebellar peduncles. This is a great way of evaluating the posterior fossa for a number of conditions. Now, one of the normal findings in the mastoid view is a normal fourth ventricle choroid plexus. And I point this out because the choroid, especially in very premature infants, may be very bulbous and prominent and resemble a clot. <clears throat> the normal fourth ventricle choroid plexus is shaped in T-shape and extends laterally a, a, along the foramina of Lushka and inferiorly and posteriorly along the foramen of Magendi. Sonographically, we can see the fourth ventricle choroid plexus as a T-shaped echogenic structure posterior to the fourth ventricle extending laterally and posteriorly along the midline. Here on the second image, we can see a thin choroid plexus extending all the way deep into the foramina of Lushka. This is again, very important to distinguish between this normal finding and posterior fossa hemorrhage. The best or the most common use for the foramen, for the mastoid view, is the evaluation of obstruction of the ventricular system due to clot. Here on the sagittal and coronal images, we can see marked dilatation of both lateral ventricles, the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle. However, it is only on the mastoid view that we can see a triangular shaped clot that is well within the center of a dilated fourth ventricle. This triangular clot represents clot that was filling a normal-sized fourth ventricle. It is now, the fourth ventricle is now much larger. In this other example, we have a child with post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus and ependymitis. In this view, we can see the third ventricle that is dilated and partially filled with echogenic clot as well as being outlined by thin, thick ependyma. And we can see a very thick echogenic ependyma surrounding the, the atria of the lateral ventricles as well. This is a common manifestation or complication of post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus. The aqueduct is also thickened and filled with clot, 
and ependema, and the clot extends all the way posteriorly to the roof of the normally shaped fourth ventricle. So we can use this view to identify the location and extent of obstruction and clot throughout the ventricular system. The mastoid fontanelle is actually very, very helpful in visualizing patients with posterior fossa abnormality. In this study by Luna and Goldstein, the mastoid view improved visualization in almost all cases, increased diagnostic confidence in 75%, and most importantly, was the only technique to show an abnormality in 46% of patients. And this has been our own experience at our institution. The last um, alternative scanning location we have is the frame and magnum. And the way we scan these babies is to put them in lateral recumbent position with their head slightly flexed. And the using a micro case transducer, we place the transducer in the sagittal midline location just under the occipital protuberance and then aim superiorly and uh, address or, or approach the uh, posterior fossa in this orientation. The transducer can be rotated 90 degrees for another view of the posterior fossa. We've performed this view in very sick premature babies who have been intubated with the help of the neonatal nurse without any complications at all. Normal anatomy here is very well seen. The image on the left is the sagittal midline ultrasound image and the image on the right is a sagittal midline pathologic specimen. And here we can see the fourth ventricle the connection between the fourth ventricle and the cisterna magna, the foramen of Magendi or Vallecula, the cisterna magna, and the prepontine cistern. You can also see the uh, cranial or cervical medullary junction. Notice how the, the um, cervical cord is straight and goes directly into the medulla. One should be able to see all of these structures in a normal infant. When you turn the transducer 90 degrees, we can now see both lobes of the cerebellum and the cisterna magna, as well as the fourth ventricle and its lateral recesses. So this is a very useful approach for evaluation of uh, congenital anomalies and uh, marked posterior fossa hydrocephalus. Here are some examples. This is a baby with an Arnold Chiari II malformation using a sagittal frame and magnum view. Now the first thing we notice is that most of the landmarks are gone. We don't see a fourth ventricle. We don't see a cisterna magna because the cerebellum is relatively large within a small posterior fossa. The large black arrow shows herniation of the tonsil through the foramen magnum. And notice the cervical medullary junction is still straight. There is no evidence of a prepontine cistern because again, this is a tight posterior fossa where normal structures are not seen. Here is an example of posthemorrhagic hydrocephalus. The image on the left is a mastoid view where we can see a dilated fourth ventricle completely filled with clot. The image on the right, however, is a sagittal midline frame and magnum view that gives us additional information showing that the clot is mostly filling the fourth ventricle, but the fourth ventricle is extending inferiorly to the cervical medullary junction. We can also notice echogenic material in the prepontine cistern that is consistent with subarachnoid hemorrhage in this cistern. Here is a composite image using both the mastoid foramen and the foramen magnum to really evaluate the effect of this hydrocephalus on
this infant's cranial cervical junction and cervical cord. The image in the top left of the screen is a transverse posterior or foramen magnum view showing marked dilatation of the fourth ventricle. Notice the absence of the, the um, cisterna magna. The image in the bottom left of the screen shows that the fourth ventricle is massively dilated, uh, filling the entire posterior fossa and extending to the level of the frame and magnum. Notice the cervical medullary junction is kinked with an anterior displacement. This is an important finding because it is often associated with pressure on the cervical medullary junction and subsequent apnea and bradycardia. The image in the top right is the mastoid foramen showing a dilated lateral ventricles, dilated third ventricle, dilated aqueduct, and the fourth ventricle as well. The image in the bottom right is a sagittal image of the cervical cord showing dilatation of the central canal as outlined by the black arrows. This is a manifestation of the pressure uh, that's in the ventricular system. Because the system is so obstructed, the central canal is the only way of egress for CSF. So we have outlined the entire area of obstruction and the consequence of obstruction using these four views. Here's another infant with marked post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, where on the anterior fontanelle view on the left, we can see marked dilatation of the third and fourth ventricle, as well as the aqueduct. <clears throat> However, the midline frame and magnum view tremendously demonstrates the extent of the fourth ventricle dilatation to the foramen of Monroe I'm sorry, the foramen magnum, with marked kinking of the cervical medullary junction. This um, is causing mass effect on the posterior fossa and foramen magnum, as you see here, outlined by the yellow errors. Finally, we have an infant who has dilated lateral ventricles, and on the sagittal image obtained through the anterior fontanelle, we can see that there is an echolucent collection above the cerebellum that is anteriorly displacing the tectum. Although this is difficult to, to characterize, on the transverse frame and magnum view, we can see outlined by arrows that this is a poorly clotted supratentorial clot pushing on the cerebellum. Notice also that on this view, neither the cisterna magna nor the fourth ventricle is well seen. So we've reviewed the alternative scanning portals that we have through the skull using the posterior fontanelle, the squamosal suture, the mastoid fontanelle, and the foramen magnum. These are quick and easy to learn and they're very effective problem-solving tools in hydrocephalus and posterior fossa abnormalities. Thank you.